I think there are three things that we need to um, remember sometimes when, when we think about freedom and we think about the Magna Carta. I think the first is that sometimes the battle takes a long time. It's not, we don't win these battles overnight. Secondly, the battle is actually never won. Sometimes you think you won the battle, but actually you have to carry on fighting that battle for freedom. And thirdly, I think we've got to remember, actually, that even though we have our disagreements, we may, may be different political parties or have different organisations, often we're, always, we're often pushing in the same direction. And what I mean by that, let's look at the first one, that it takes time. The Magna Carta built on a previous document, the 1100 Charter of Liberties. And if I remember my history correctly, that really only gave, uh, that only limited the, the, the rule, or gave the, uh, extended the rights to free men. It did not apply to serfs or to slaves. We needed, centuries later, other acts. If I remember my, my history correctly, the Petition of Right, the, ha the Act of Habeas Corpus, the Bill of Right, and then the Act of Settlement, to further entrench those freedoms. And we have to remember that took centuries. And sometimes it, we may get impatient, we may think that we're not winning the battle, but sometimes we have to keep chipping away to ensure that we continue to fight that fight. And I want to give you one simple example. In the 1950s, the IEA wrote a book about telecommunications and said that in how telecoms should not be the monopoly of the post offices of the countries and said that you should have a competitive market with different, different companies competing against each other so customers could choose where they went. People thought they were mad right-wing nutters. This is what they dismissed them as. Of course they said, everyone knows that the telephone system is an actual monopoly and only the post office can run the, the, uh, can run the, the telecom system. It took 30 odd years for us to separate regulation and operation and for us to have a private telephone company. It took another 10 years for us to have a duopoly, a competitive, and then it took another 10 years to have a truly competitive market, or relatively competitive market. That took 50 years. So sometimes as politicians, when we don't see us, our, our attempts to roll back the state bear fruit overnight, or when you as activists don't see those, uh, those attempts bear fruit overnight, just keep the keep and continue the fight. The second thing is that the battle is never over. I remember thinking, looking back in the late 80s, early 90s, thinking that, I remember you know, even Norman Tebbit once said that we, that we wouldn't win the battle until the Labour Party had stopped being a Socialist Party. And when we saw New Labour, and we saw them a sort of a mild form of socialism, many people said, we've won the battle. You know, um, they don't believe, even Tony Blair didn't believe that the state should be the provider of services or, 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 or run companies. But yet, look at where we are now. Who would have thought, when we looked at New Labour, when we looked at the, um, the end of the Conservative government in the 90s, who would have thought that we'd be in a position now when the banks had to be bailed out by taxpayers, that we had nationalisation and that we would be in such massive debt? And so we've got to remember that we've got to fight that battle all over again, just as those who were here in the Senators felt they had to fight the battle for freedom and roll back the state. We now have to continue that battle because that battle is never won. And thirdly, I think, and finally, is this point that sometimes we fight against each other and we call each other names and say, you're in that group and I'm in that group, but we are only, we're the only true guardians of freedom. And sometimes I think you've got to remember that you can see a particular situation but come to quite different conclusions. And the anecdote that sums it up for me is the annual interfaith golf match that was put, that, that's played when we were in an area um, near some golf courses. And it goes like this. It's the annual interfaith golf match, the rabbi, the imam, and the vicar. And they to turn up, and they all tee off, and they all achieve par four on the first hole. They go to the second hole, and they're waiting. There are some, still some players ahead of them on the green. And they wait, and they wait. They send their caddy off. The caddy comes back and says, I'm very sorry, but we're gonna have, it's going to be some time because you see the players ahead of us are blind. And so the vicar says, well, that's incredible because on Sunday my sermon was going to be about the miracles of Christ. And here we see a modern day miracle. We see these players, the blind, blind players playing golf. I'm going to talk about that in my sermon. And then the rabbi says, well, that's interesting because the history of the Jewish people is one of overcoming great adversity. Um, and here is an example of some people who've overcome great adversity. 
and I'm going to use that in my, in my, in my sermon on Saturday. And then he turns to the Imam, and the Imam strokes his beard and he says, what I don't understand is if they're blind, why can't they play at night? <laughs> <laughs> and what that demonstrates to us all is that you can look at one set of circumstances and come to quite different conclusions. And whatever our views are, whatever party we are a member of or whatever organisation we are, let us not forget that what unites us today, what brings us out in this glorious British summer weather, <laughs> is that we all believe in freedom and we should never forget that. Thank you very much.